My name is David Orban, and I am very glad to have uh, all of you following the show. Before we start, I want to remind you that even if we are live, you can always watch episodes uh, from the past, both on Facebook and on YouTube. And on YouTube, you can also subscribe to the channel. We also have a Discord community, and I invite you to join on davidorban.com slash Discord. And finally, if you find the show valuable, as well as the other content that I produce and the knowledge that I share, you're welcome to become a supporter on patreon.com. Today's episode is Refounding Physics. The metaphors that inspire the stories we tell ourselves about the world have immense power. They guide us in explorations that otherwise would not happen. Is the world a playground for gods, we would ask 3,000 years ago? Uh, or the world is maybe a giant clockwork? Uh, it would be natural to think uh, in the times of Newton. These were both uh, dominating views. And today we have our computers and we started asking ourselves if the metaphor of computers is useful for describing the world, including at the most fundamental levels. Today's guest to talk about all of this is Stephen Wolfram. Stephen is the creator of Mathematica, Wolfram Alpha and the Wolfram Language. Uh, the author of a uh, new kind of science and the founder and ceo of uh, wolfram research uh, over the course of nearly four decades he has been a pioneer in the development and application of computational thinking and has been responsible for many discoveries inventions and innovations in science technology and business my first job uh, was with an artificial intelligence company in the 80s that was also the local partner for Mathematica. Mathematica. Yeah. I remember the cloth covered box and trying to run it from uh, floppy disks on early Macs. And Stephen and I uh, would end up meeting on average uh, once a decade. At the first Mathematica conference in 1990 in Redwood City or the second one in Boston. Then at the Comdex in Las Vegas, uh, where he would give everyone a seashell symbolizing the new kind of science in 2002. As well as at the H plus summit at Harvard University that I organized in 2010, where he was a keynote speaker, uh, speaking about the future of the human condition. So here we are a decade later in 2020, and I already setting up the date uh, for our next meeting in 2030. Last week, Stephen announced the physics project. He's searching for a better name. So if you have one, feel free to suggest it. Following decades of development of tools and importantly, a new level of algorithmic intuition, the aim is to show the mathematical foundations of physics as a radical new approach towards the unification of relativity, quantum mechanics with potentially testable predictions. So. Welcome, Stephen, to Searching for the Question Live. Thanks. So um, you are a live streaming monster. You have been doing how many hours of uh, live streaming? Uh, um... Oh, it's terrible. You're right. I've, I, I started about a year and a half ago. Um, oops. I just uh, tried to make my camera see me. Ah, Go ahead. Yes. It's, it seems to be seeing you. OK. Yes, I can. I can see you through your camera at least. <laughs> okay. um, it uh, uh, no, I think I started about a year and a half ago, uh, taking the internal design reviews that we do for our software and making them, exposing them to the world. And we've done about what is it, five hundred hours of that. And I've been uh, now with a physics project. I thought it would be interesting and valuable to sort of try doing science in a more open way than it's been done before. You know, it's something that's made possible by our modern technology. And uh, to start live streaming a bunch of the internal kind of brainstorming meetings, it's very, it's actually a very scary thing to do. Like we did one yesterday about the relationship between distributed computing and physics. And, uh, uh, you know, where these ideas are very embryonic. Um, it's, um, it's, it's a little bit, little bit scary to be exposing this at such an early stage to the world. But it was great to get lots of feedback and comments and suggestions and so on from people who are watching it. It's really an, it, really an interesting process. It takes a lot of confidence, uh, which uh, evidently you, you, you don't lack. But uh, it also, I think, represents 
uh, an evolution in your own thinking towards an openness that if I'm not mistaken, at least at the very beginning, you didn't have in terms of how you would create a, a, a very solid and very profitable private enterprise with no qualms about having people pay license fees for the software. And then little by little, you embraced, for example, making the Wolfram language more openly available and so on and so forth. So um, is there going to be a further evolution? Uh, I mean, Should it be the case that, uh, that, uh, that, the, that if the physics projects is successful, people should independently be able to, to run it uh, uh, even without uh, Wolfram Research as a company behind uh, the platforms, right? Yeah, look, I mean, the, the thing is, my goal has been sort of building a long-term uh, intellectual thing, you know, building this, this sort of big piece of technology, this big sort of intellectual edifice. And the question is, what's the best way to do that in the world? And what we've seen over the last 30 something years is an evolution of what's possible to do in the world. And so, you know, at the beginning, I was, uh, I did things that people thought were really crazy. I have a private company, I don't have investors. I just, you know, just started making a company that made a living by selling something to people who found it useful. And that's, that seems very, like at the time, people were saying, that's crazy, you should be getting venture capital, you should be, you know, doing all this kind of thing. And I was like, well, I just want to, you know, I have this sort of simple model for how to make things work. And uh, it, it has, in fact, worked really well and allowed me to kind of sort of keep building the same sort of uh, intellectual structure for a very long time. Now, you know, as the world has evolved and the web came into existence and, uh, you know, lots of other kinds of things started happening, you know, we did things like Wolfram Alpha is a completely free system uh, for people. You know, it has some some uh, pro upsell mechanism. But um, and with Wolfram Language, similarly, we're having, you know, free Wolfram Language for developers, all these kinds of things. The question is, what's the, you know, what's the right way in the world to build something that has kind of a uh, potential for, sort of long-term consistent growth. And you know, it's an, it'll be an interesting thing to see. I mean, for example, with the physics project, one of the things that um, uh, you know, I, I want to see is we're sort of putting it out there for the world and it's like, okay, how is this going to work? How is it, you know, is it in fact going to be the case that the majority of the work that's done on it is not done by us? You know, or, or is it going to be um, uh, something where uh, we're still having to drive it all. I mean, I think that, um, uh, you know, in, in, in what we've done with, for example, Wolfram Language, you know, I feel that uh, it's sort of been, been essential that, that we have this kind of um, uh, consistent driving force where, you know, I've spent a large part of my last 30 years kind of trying to develop, uh, tr you know, trying to push forward sort of the, the intellectual boundaries of what's possible with the language. You, you you knew what you wanted to do. You didn't need your investors to tell you. Well, yes, I, I, <laughs> I've, I've right. I've, I've been you know for better or worse. I've I've been a CEO for more than half my life now, and I've I've been kind of a um, uh, I'm one of these people who doesn't really have a boss except for my employees and and uh, and the world. And uh, I would also say my wife. I don't know about you. Uh, the the um, challenge is to recognize that the freedom you buy with that independence uh, imposes certain constraints um, was that was it was it uh, ever the case that uh, you would have wanted 10 times the computing resources and you were thinking if I did an IPO maybe I could have that uh, and and you decided it wasn't worth it yeah I mean we, we thought about in the early 90s I thought about taking our company public and I think that the um, uh, you know the real thing at that time was just it's like okay we bring in a bunch of money what would we do with it I asked mm -hmm. my team and frankly the things people came up with weren't that convincing and you know today the company you know today we could certainly do more than uh, uh, than we are if we had more people and um, you know that's that's a thing um, gradually. Over time, you know, we, uh, you know, it, it's it's something where, um, in principle, 
um, you know, we could probably, we have maybe 800 people together around the world. Um, and, uh, you know, if we had uh, 2,000 people, I think we could um, keep them, uh, you know, uh, I think we could, we could probably move faster. If you said, what could we do with 10,000 people? The answer is, I don't think we'd be able to manage them very well. Um, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's one of these things, but, but we've also been fortunate that over time we've built up really a, I would say a spectacularly talented group, which we've sort of been, been sourcing from, uh, uh, from around the world. Um, and that's, um, that's something that I wouldn't, um, you know, just sort of throwing more, more people into the story, I don't think would, would necessarily help. But no, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that, you know, I'm, I'm always thinking about sort of trying to innovate not only on the technology side of what we're doing, but also in terms of how we interface with the world, what we do in terms of what, uh, um, uh, you know, what we, um, you know, we, we've got us, we, we originally created perhaps, I, I think you were probably involved in this in Italy back in the day, creating our whole site license mechanism for universities. And that's, that's been really successful because it means... Uh, absolutely. And it was, it was quite uh, cool in, in, in the floating license manager that was able to allocate a license when it would be used and then take it and give it to another computer. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that we did together uh, at the time was uh, to organize uh, a, a conference at uh, University uh, of, uh, of Milan, uh, which was uh, uh, crazy enough. Uh, we had uh, 12 uh, sponsors uh, that uh, brought their hardware. At the time, the supercomputing leaders, uh, Convex and Apollo oh, yeah. and Sun Microsystems and, and all the others, all these brands don't exist anymore. And each of them would have a version of Mathematica uh, running uh, on them. Because from a methodological point of view, just like with the book, uh, and, and I will keep it here rather than moving it closer to the camera because the, the, the focus goes crazy otherwise. Um, what you always had is that you would, instead of doing something, you would generate it. So. The book was generated through Mathematica code, and Mathematica was also compiled for the target computers with, well, I don't know at what degree, but the objective was to compile it to these target platforms uh, in as an automated fashion as possible, and, and you would have an incredible coverage across the various pieces of hardware. Right, yeah, I mean, look, this has been a long time story of my company and my efforts is you know automate as much as possible i mean this is kind of the the um, i mean this is why we're able to do what we're able to do with as comparatively few people as we have is that we've sort of progressively automated the different levels of of uh, uh of what we're trying to build and that's been i mean it's it's been a really successful idea for me it's been something for me now with wolfram language kind of the the goal is sort of automate as much as possible let the humans figure out what they want to do then let the machine kind of automatically uh, actually execute what what needs to be done um, it, and 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 that was that and then I thought about it and then I really realized that I would swap him with you because you you were able to build a tool that was what you wanted to do and just keep doing it uh, for the past 30 40 years uh, with the tool becoming ever more powerful and serve your purpose in building a better version of the tool. Yeah, right. I mean, I've, I've been I've been pretty lucky in my life. I've been kind of, I've alternated between doing basic science and doing technology development. And kind of what seems to happen is, you know, do some basic science, realize how I can make more technology, build technology, get to use that in basic science. Actually, really kind of, uh, uh, even with this physics project, the remarkable thing is that I'm pretty sure we're going to be able to use a bunch of ideas from that to sort of invent a new level of distributed computing, which is something I completely had not expected. Even if you'd asked me three weeks ago, was that going to happen? I would have said, no, I, I don't really see that. But we sort of realized that that's, that's possible. And that's a, you know, that, that I think has been sort of typical of what I've been able to do is, is that, you know, the science is driven by having methodological advances which come from technology and the technology is informed by being able to to know more about the science. And, uh, we have, uh, of course, uh, people from all over the world uh, saying hello uh, from Los Angeles, uh, uh, Robert, uh, from Pakistan, Rehan, uh, 
Babele from Italy, not only saying hello, but also asking uh, questions. Uh, and uh, and uh, I will read out their questions. Uh, 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 I from Turkey, um, but I am keeping you for me for the moment uh, for for my questions as well. And 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 I will have them in in three groups, uh, talking about uh, methodology and entrepreneurship, talking about science and mathematics, and then talking about more radical ideas around the future. So. Um, talking about methodology, um, you have been um, one representative of a heterodoxy in physics. Um, string theory occupied everybody's mind and kind of um, uh, homogenized and monopolized uh, the field. Uh, but there are people who either because, like you, they built a financial independence, or Garrett Lisi is another one. Uh, he bought a bunch of Apple stock and a bunch of Bitcoin, and now he's uh, on his Hawaiian island playing with the uh, L8 and, 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 and whatever else. Um, but the, 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 the methodological uh, issue is that you cannot have a set whose members are the representatives of the heterodoxy because each of them are different. Each of them, uh, if, you, if you look at Lee Smolin and his criticism of, of string uh, uh, theory and, uh, and his uh, quantum loop gravity, etc., do you think it would make sense to compare notes and to, and to see whether both methods and, and, and theories and approaches um, are different in similar ways from the dominant uh, uh, players? Yeah, so, so I mean, the, the big surprise to me, okay, so first of all, a little bit of uh, history. I mean, when I was a kid, I loved physics, and I kind of started studying physics very early and, you know, started publishing papers when I was about 15 or so, and was a sort of professional physicist by the time I was 20. Um, so I was, I was in kind of the, the, the standard orthodoxy of physics. And I happened to work on physics at a time, late 1970s, when it was sort of a golden age for physics. And when uh, sort of things were happening very quickly and it's kind of cool things I did when I was a teenager, people still care about and so on. Um, it was, uh, so it, it's kind of a, a um, so I was, I had this, I've, I've been in this strange position where I was right in the middle of sort of uh, the, the orthodoxy of physics and, uh, you know, I. I pretty much got to know everybody who was, um, uh, yeah, there's, a, there's my piece of scrapbook, I think, about some of those times. You know, I kind of got to know uh, all the people who were kind of the leaders in physics of the time. And, um, you know, they're probably 20, 30 years older than me mostly. Um, but uh, uh, that was sort of a, a, um, a um, so that was kind of my, my entry point into physics. Then I kind of got involved in what I saw as being a sort of, uh, uh, well, I got involved in technology and doing things with computers, but I also got involved in what I saw as being sort of a generalization of the approach of physics, which was to kind of use programs as a way to understand understand the world, sort of a, a way to drill below standard physics and, um, uh, and see something more general. And then, so I worked on that for many, many years, um, and uh, I had thought about sort of I, I kind of started thinking about kind of how would I do fundamental physics on the basis of what I'd figured out about computation. I started thinking about that maybe 30 years ago um, and actually made really good progress in the 1990s and probably should have finished the job at that time, but for a variety of reasons didn't, um, and then wrote this big book that you were showing earlier, New Kind of Science, that came out in 2002. And um, uh, there was kind of a question of should I... Uh, part of what I did in that book, the, the main thrust of that book was a methodological idea, which was to use computation as a paradigm for understanding things in the world. And that that kind of idea, um, I would say, has been really dramatically successful. I mean, perhaps almost silently so, but it's really been quite a dramatic thing that for, you know, for 300 years, we were kind of dominated by a time when if you were doing sort of exact science you were doing it with things like mathematical equations. And over the last 15 years or so, there's been sort of a transition to 
typical new models that people make are made with programs rather than with equations. And that's been a, you know, it's been a sort of dramatic uh, change. What, um, what hasn't, what, what, you know, part of my book was sort of the use case of apply these computational ideas to the specific app, so to speak, of physics. Um, I didn't think that was the key part of that book. At the time when it came out in 2002, at least some physicists, you know, really thought that was the key thing, and they hated it because it was very methodologically different from what had happened in physics before. And so partly as a result of that, I didn't pursue it that hard because I figured, you know, the core part of the, 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 the core of the target market does not want this project. And there are plenty of things that I'm super interested in doing, which I think of as, in a sense, more general than physics. I think of the sort of computational universe of all possible programs as being this, this bigger, richer thing where our physical universe is, in a sense, just one data point in that computational universe. And that was so I, you know, I was off doing other things and building things like Wolf Malfa and so on. And then I got back, oh, about a year, year and a half ago. I kind of had uh, a, a little idea about sort of a way to make progress with physics, and then got a couple of young physicists were who had been coming to our summer school um, were uh, like, "This is interesting. You really got to do something with it." Um, and they're like, "We'll help you do something interesting." And so then last fall, I I got started on this project of seeing you know what we could actually figure out on the basis of these ideas about physics. And the thing that was the huge surprise, first of all, it was a huge surprise how well it worked. But the biggest surprise, and I'm, I'm finally coming back to your question, because I, I, I think it's, um, it's an interesting question, but it requires some sort of background to be able to, to address it. Um, yeah, the, the, the people listening to us have attention spans that go further than 15 second TikTok videos. So don't worry. <laughs> it's, it's, um, but, but so, so, you know, the big surprise, I thought we were building this kind of new approach to physics that was based on sort of computational ideas and that it would be uh, quite discrepant and alien to existing physics. The big surprise that really only became clear, you know, a couple, three months ago is actually the things we've done sort of dovetail beautifully with a lot of other approaches that people have taken to fundamental physics. That's that was a big surprise to me. I wasn't expecting that. In retrospect, it's now obvious. But like so many things, it wasn't, it was, it's only obvious in retrospect. I mean, the, the, the basic point is that when you have this kind of computational model of the world, there is this phenomenon I call computational irreducibility. It's, it's hard to work out what the consequences of these rules you define actually will be. But, uh, and I thought that was where we'd sort of been stuck in, in making progress in physics. But it turns out that there's this kind of layer of computational reducibility in which essentially what we know about physics lives. So things like general relativity, the theory of gravity, quantum field theory, um, those kinds of things, they live in this layer of computational reducibility, which I didn't know was going to be there. And that so, layer. So is it the case that uh, contrary to Gödel's um, uh, conclusions, where the uh, undecidability uh, uh, intrinsic to formal systems appears so early that even arithmetic uh, uh, or, or, or slightly beyond uh, uh, contains uh, statements that cannot be proven within that axiomatic system, the computational irreducibility kicks in um, farther out. Uh, no, it's the other way around, I think. So I think computational irreducibility is there from the get-go. What happens is, whenever there is computational irreducibility, there are always pockets of reducibility. And the question is, how important are those? And the answer that, again, is, is sort of obvious in retrospect, but certainly wasn't obvious going into this, is the fact that we can make sense of the world is a sign that there is computational reducibility at some level in the physical world that we perceive. In other words, it could be the case that everything in our world is utterly unpredictable or is, is requires sort of immense computational effort to work out what's going to happen. But actually, we know that there are kind of fairly, you know, we, we, there are sort of regularities in the world that we are used to 
perceiving, and those represent computational reducibility, and those are what physics has got its claws into, so to speak, over the last 100, 300 years. They're the things that lead us to theories like the theory of gravity, things about uh, space and time and the structure of space and time. Now, there are other features of the universe that live in this kind of computationally irreducible layer that physics has not really had much to say about um, and that are hard work to deal with. But the fact that there's this layer of reducibility that is that, that, you know, that we've now been able to, so, so in a sense what we've been able to do is there is a sort of existing approaches in physics and there's kind of a, a new foundation that we seem to have been able to find that's based on computational ideas that is full of irreducibility, it's full of Gödel's theorem-like questions. But sort of floating on top of that is this layer of reducibility that happens to include most of the physics we know. Um, and so if you ask about these other approaches, you know, I had been very pessimistic. I thought, well, you know, that we, we're going to find a bunch of stuff and we're going to be right and they're going to be wrong or we're going to be wrong and they're going to be right. Who knows? But what's turned out to be the case, it seems, is that these other approaches, you know, a lot of, for example, string theory. I, I fully expect that string theory is a limiting case of one corner of one of our models. I think twister theory is going to end up being related to a thing we call the multi-way causal graph. I think loop quantum gravity and spin networks are likely to be relevant. In fact, in fact, later this afternoon, I'm going to do one of my one of my uh, uh, kind of um, uh, perhaps gutsy um, live streams. We're talking about the origins of quantum angular momentum and quantum spin and so on. And I won't be surprised if we end up concluding that some of the things we can figure out. Uh, kind of have relationships to to things like spin networks and loop quantum gravity. We'll see. So, now, so, yeah. So I mean, so so what I'm what I'm saying is, I think in the end, many of these approaches have kind of a uh, uh, a mathematical structure at least that is going to play well, so to speak. I think that that I really thought a lot of them would sort of get thrown away, and it's just not the case. Um, it's uh, instead, I think it's it's really going to be a a, uh, I, I hope it's going to be a, a really good situation where all the work that's been done in these different approaches and all the kind of mathematical ideas that have been built up uh, will have a slightly different foundation, but they'll be able to kind of work together probably more harmoniously than they have in the past um, to, uh, to kind of understand more about how physics works. So at the basis uh, of the physics project uh, uh, is the concept of abstract elements that are in uh, certain relationships uh, uh, among each other, uh, and these relationships evolve uh, through rule sets. But rather than just considering one rule set, you consider an abstract space of uh, um, every possible rule set, uh, and then you define certain hypersurfaces across uh, different evolutions of the elements that correspond or, or they end up corresponding, having the features that uh, make the equivalence not unreasonable to um, concrete components of uh, uh, our traditional physical models, such as uh, momentum or angular momentum and so on, both in a relativistic uh, space as well as in a, in a uh, quantum mechanical uh, space. Uh, now, one thing that I didn't have the chance of understanding yet, and I'm, I'm, I'm very curious, is whether there is an interaction mechanism between rule sets that could represent in a universal Darwinistic manner an evolutionary um, vector so that the selection mechanism to find the rule set uh, is, is um, the end result, or at least the current result of this kind of uh, evolution at the, at the basis of the universe. So, okay, so that's a, the, the, there's a complicated issue. So one point is sort of the simplest way to describe what we're doing is find a rule that if you run it for long enough, reproduces our whole universe. Now, it turns out that there is an equivalence between rules, 
And it's sort of similar to the equivalence that we know exists between different universal computers. But in a sense, what's happening is when you're looking at sort of all possible rules, when, when we as observers are seeing what the consequences of those rules are, we are essentially defining a reference frame, defining a, a way of understanding the world in which we will attribute the behavior of the world to, for example, maybe a single particular rule or a, let's just say a single rule. It's a more complicated. The, the, the full, full story is a little bit more complicated than that. But, but um, uh, you know, we attribute the sort of the, uh, uh, the behavior of the universe to a particular rule. Um, we could have picked another rule and we could have essentially programmed the universe with that other rule because all these rules are computation universal. But in a sense, the, the way that we're, you're getting into the most philosophically complicated part of, of um, uh, you, you, you've headed right for the, 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 the place of sort of maximum philosophical complexity. Um, okay. <laughs> um, but, but um, uh, you know, one of the questions is if you say the universe is governed by some rule and you say, okay, we've got the rule, here it is, then the immediate question is why is it that rule and not another? And for example, if that rule is comparatively simple, why is it, how do we explain that we got the universe that corresponds to a simple rule? Why did we, why did we get in this very kind of um, uh, center of the universe of all possible universes? Why are we at the center of the universe of all possible universes? It seems very surprising. Well, what I've come to realize is that what's going on is that actually it's sort of, in a sense, all these possible universes uh, are there and two entities within those universes governed by the same rules that those universes themselves have, they all look equivalent. But the description that we have depends on our particular way of describing the world. And that's based on ultimately things like our senses, the physics we've built, the mathematics we've built, and so on. And so for us, there's a kind of a, a, a natural rule that will uh, mesh with the physics we know and so on. We can readily imagine, and again, we're heading for the, the most complicated sort of philosophical implications of this, but we can imagine uh, sort of within the same universe a, an utterly incoherent description of the universe. So in other words, we think we're describing the universe in terms of, I don't know, uh, slices of successive slices of time. You know, for example, for us, we have the special feature, you might say, that the speed of light is very fast compared to our internal brain processing. And that's a consequence of our size relative to the universe. It's a consequence of the, you know, lots of kinds of things. But, but that means that for us, it's kind of uh, reasonable to say, we'll think about the world in terms of sort of uh, slices of simultaneity. Because, you know, we look around and, um, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a whole nother, uh, whole nother story. Um, the uh, uh, so 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 anyway the the, the thing that um, uh, so we're we're kind of um, um, uh, you know we, we we have this experience of the world and we have these descriptions of the world that are kind of based on the place where we are with respect to our senses and with respect to sort of our size in the universe and so on and one of the bizarre implications of this of this kind of uh, uh, realization about things about how physics works is that you can imagine these sort of utterly incoherent views of the universe. I mean, I, I've always taken the point of view when we think about, you know, extraterrestrial intelligence and so on. I've got lots to say about that and about why it doesn't really make sense to talk about, you know, uh, to make a distinction between sort of the intelligent and the merely computational and so on. But, you know, I had always at least believed that um, uh, if, you know, if we were dealing with, um, uh, yeah, that was a fun talk. Um, the uh, the um, that that if um, you know if we were dealing with uh, sort of the extraterrestrials, whoever they might be, that at the um, uh, at the very least they would share our physics. At the very least, we're, we you know both we and they would be sort of living in the same universe. But I've kind of realized that uh, in some sense that's not true. You can have what about, what about mathematics? Are they going to share our same mathematics? Not a chance. Not a okay. chance. So, so exactly because mathematics is, uh, sorry, physics is mathematics according to your project. Uh, but well, well, no, for, for is, is the incomprehensibility untranslatable 
or just beyond any reasonable effort? Well, that's a good question. I mean, so, so the question, what does one mean by translation? I mean, one, one typically means to convert meaning from one form to another. But the concept of meaning presupposes a whole stack of ideas. And meaning, we can easily attribute meaning to humans. We, we kind of know, you know, we have a sense of, uh, from our own uh, sort of impression of what's meaningful, we have a sense of meaningfulness for other humans. Even for AIs, for example, the notion of meaningfulness is hard to extend to them. And, you know, this, this kind of, and, you know, I'm, I'm fond of pointing out that, well, this thing I call the principle of computational equivalence that kind of implies that sort of at a computational level, many different kinds of things in the world have the same level of capabilities. And that, you know, we're used to making statements like, you know, the weather has a mind of its own, which sounds like one of these sort of pre-scientific kind of, uh, um, surely we know more from, from, from all the science we've done. But actually, at sort of a computational level, the weather is doing things just as sophisticated as our brains. The only thing that we can't, we don't know how to attribute to the weather is something like purpose or meaning. It's like, what is the weather trying to achieve? You know, it's, um, that's something we, we don't have an easy way to, to transfer what we're, you know, the, the way we think about things to that. So, you know, imagine your, your favorite extraterrestrial and, you know, maybe, you know, it, 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 you know, for, we identify life on Earth in terms of having, you know, RNA and cell membranes and all those kinds of details. But your average extraterrestrial, uh, let's assume that they're, they're not, they don't have those same detailed uh, 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 correspondences with us. Let's say that, uh, you know, a good example might be the magnetosphere of a pulsar. You know, very different sort of physical materials, um, but nevertheless, uh, sort of doing sophisticated computation. And now let's try and distinguish, you know, the pulsar has a mind of its own versus, you know, we have minds of our own, so to speak. How do we distinguish sort of the, the purely, uh, yeah, good example. Um, how do we distinguish the kind of the, um, uh, the sort of um, us as, uh, you know, how do we distinguish the, the planet that appears to have sort of a mind of its own from, um, uh, from um, uh, uh, you know, a, a mind that we are more familiar with, with, with humans and so on. You know, I've, I've, one of the things I've, I've, I've sometimes commented is once we finally become used to AI, that is our first form of sort of alien intelligence that we are commonly exposed to. When we really become used to AI, we will no longer be thinking that hard about extraterrestrial intelligence because we'll realize that intelligences are, you know, there's sort of an abstracted version of that that exists in many places in the universe. And we will have seen our first example in, in, in the AIs that we create. Yes, and, and as a matter of fact, I, I almost never use uh, AI in the singular. Uh, because uh, we will have millions of different kinds of intelligences and and uh, their passion, their curiosity, their purpose will evolve in trajectories that uh, almost never going to intersect uh, with uh, with what we define those uh, to be worthwhile pursuits. Well, uh, I mean, let, let me let me stop you there because I think it's a really interesting point. I mean, the, you know, you say the purposes of the AIs will evolve. But I think the notion of purpose is a pretty human thing. That is, we can, the things we attribute, you know, when we talk about purpose, we end up basing that on sort of the experience of our culture, civilization, et cetera. You know, you know people say AIs will automate all these things in the world. But I think the ultimate thing that they don't get to automate is what they actually want to do. That is, you know, there is no disembodied version of purpose, it, it, you know, whatever that disembodied version of purpose is, we have to say, well, what purpose does the weather have? What purpose does the AI have? I don't think it has an abstract sense of purpose. I think that's something that is sort of a thing that has to be injected. Um, you know, the, the way that we uh, deal with the world, we, we, we humans from our history have developed this notion of purpose. And without that, without that, the, what what are the AIs doing without that? You know, I run all these programs, cellular automata, or other kinds of things in the computational universe. They just run. They do their thing. They do a lot of rich and sophisticated things, 
but they seem to be to us quite purposeless. The only way that we sort of attach purpose to them is by us somehow communicating with them and sort of, uh, you know, being able to communicate our notion of purpose to them. And I mean, you know, in, in a sense, some large part of what I've done in my life, building Wolfram language, it's about building this sort of full-scale computational language, which allows us to take on the one hand sort of human thinking and on the other hand computation and being able to, to provide a bridge that lets one communicate kind of what it is we humans want to do and want to think about with what computation makes possible. I mean, that's a, so I think it's a really interesting point, this, this point about, you know, the purposes of AIs. I think disembodied, they don't have a purpose. We have to be able to communicate with them to give them what we would consider to be purpose. And, and, and operationally, purpose is already an emergent phenomenon that we uh, uh, um, received uh, that uh, um, enables uh, biological reproduction or optimizing resource uh, uh, allocation to certain human uh, uh, societies and, and relationships. Uh, and and uh, one of my examples of, of AIs uh, with which communication is is hard and and whose uh, operations, if we don't want to use the word purpose, um, are inscrutable, uh, are for example cities or or corporations, where um, too often the human components uh, relinquish responsibility by pointing out how little they are able to influence the mechanism that is complex to the point to be beyond what each individual is is, is able to do and um, do you do you think that uh, tools that uh, uh, either you are building or others employing the tools that you are building uh, are going to be available in order to better manage emerging complexity so that uh, the the ability for the human civilization to address uh, increasingly uh, on uh, I I increasingly challenging times and phenomena uh, improves? Well, so I think the thing to realize is there is a limitation on what science can achieve. You know, the last 500 years, we've basically been on this big run where we kind of think science is going to do everything for us. But we kind of already knew that there was sort of seeds of trouble with Gödel's theorem, where, you know, we could already see there were limitations, even from within mathematics, there were limitations of what you could do with mathematics. What's happened with computational irreducibility is a more major version of that. Even though you might know the rules by which something works, and, you know, we're living inside that with this pandemic, for example, even though you might know things about the rules by which things work, it's not easy to sort of jump ahead and say, so this is what's going to happen. It has been the kind of the assumption of science, you know, what, what happened with Galileo and Newton, people like that, was they found this way of carving off some piece of physics where it was possible to say, this is how the planets are going to move. And it was possible to do that in a, in a very computationally reduced way by, by, having, by doing sort of a small amount of computational work, you could say what was going to happen a million years from now and so on. Now, that, that that was a successful carving off of a piece of the physical world. I think that there's uh, a lot of the phys even the you know there's a lot of the computational world we already knew there was a lot of the computational world that cannot be carved off that way where there is computational irreducibility. The kind of the very interesting thing about our new physics project is it's strongly suggesting that the foundations of our physical world simply are rooted in computational irreducibility. It's saying there's layers of computational reusability. Now, why is that? One of the things we have to realize is a lot of our existence in civilization is built on the pockets of computational reducibility that exist in the world. That is the fact that we have, you know, the way most of our engineering is done, it's done on the basis of computational reusability. We want to build engineering systems where we have traditionally built engineering systems where we can readily predict what they'll do. Now, sometimes we'll build a system, maybe it's a city, maybe it's some system of laws, whatever else, where we'll build it, we think we're sort of sculpting things in a certain way, but actually there's computational irreducibility there and things will happen that were sort of unintended consequences that we could never predict. I mean, I think the thing, 
thing to realize, for example, with the AIs, we have a very direct version of this. It's like, uh, you know, let's imagine we're trying to define ethics for the AIs. We're trying to tell the AIs what do we want them to do. It's very much like the story with Gödel's theorem. Gödel's theorem is kind of like, let's put in place a bunch of axioms that give us, in his case, the integers and nothing but the integers. Let's put in place a system of laws for the AIs that give us just what we want and nothing but what we want. It's, it, you know, computational irreducibility kind of tells you that that's not ultimately going to be possible. So, it, 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 I, I had a, an existential conundrum uh, learning about Gödel's uh, theorem, and uh, I um, overcame the crisis by understanding that uh, it provides us with the choice of which uh, of, of the undecidable theorem, for example, uh, whether true or false, we want to assume as a new, com new axiomatic component of an extended system. And, and, we, and we can keep going like that, uh, building a path uh, in what you would call the, the computational universe, or at least the mathematical universe, which is admittedly some, somewhat arbitrary uh, because there, there's no reason a priori to choose left or right. And Gregory Chaitin gave me a, a similar uh, uh, difficulty because um, for, for our viewers, um, his results basically demonstrate that uh, there is a, a, a vast uh, uh, infinity uh, or, 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 or an infinity whose uh, uh, cardinality is, is, is vastly larger than uh, what we commonly meet uh, of mathematical truths that have no reasonable derivation. They exist, but we will never be able to derive them. And, and, and that was uh, like, you know, created an anguish. And, and, and I am trying maybe still in the process of, of overcoming it by saying, okay, that is uh, like uh, medieval maps of Africa uh, uh, sunt leones. There are lions here of, of empty space that we will never paint uh, with our knowledge. It, it is the reign of unreason. And since, at least since uh, the, the, uh, the Enlightenment, our objective and, and maybe our illusion uh, was to, to be able to explain the world with, with reason and science, then it becomes our responsibility to draw a path between islands that that can be explained and that we can uh, own and that we can translate into engineering and, and progress. Yeah, so I think there's a bunch of very interesting points there. I mean, so one thing to realize about computational irreducibility, this, this sort of difficulty of understanding the world you might think of as bad, one good thing about computational irreducibility is it sort of means that our progression through time, our existence, our, you know, what happens to us, in a sense, is, is achieving something. You know, if there was, if the whole world was computationally reducible, it's like, why are we bothering to live through all of this time? We just, you know, we can just jump ahead and say the answer is 42 or whatever. Um, and computational irreducibility says that this progression through time that we're taking in our sort of path in the physical universe and so on is something which is ultimately, uh, a, you know, an irreducible piece of progress, so to speak. So uh, another point about... Um, um, so, so uh, sorry, that, that also means that uh, uh, you don't believe the one electron universe is plausible because that would represent this kind of nickelism of meaninglessness, where um, everything exists in space and time at once, and our choices, our progression, uh, uh, they, 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 because it has been reduced to just one one thing. Okay, so so this is a this is an elaborate philosophical issue because in, for example, our model of physics right now, in some sense, we are reducing physics to mathematics. Mm -hmm. In some sense, we're just saying. All of the physical world, everything that exists is, in a sense, one might say logically, it's not really logic so much as it's just, it is deterministically deducible from this one starting point. So you might say, oh, that means everything, quotes already exists. 
in some sense, that's true. Everything is, is predetermined, but the process of actually working out what happens is something that takes an irreducible amount of computational effort. Now, you know, if you ask the question, sort of, is uh, so the, the the progression of the universe is that computation happening, and it's it's um, uh, and I think that, but you might say at some level you you could say let's imagine we're outside the universe, we're looking at it from the outside. Then at some level it is like this thing where everything already exists, because abstractly it, it's like do all the integers already exist even though nobody has actually written one down? It's, it's a, uh, this is a more extreme version of that. You know, I, I want to also comment on, on, uh, on, on Greg Chaitin's, um, uh, Greg and I are good friends, and um, one of the things that, um, uh, sort of an interesting uh, question that's come up in past years, although I think, um, I think the things we've done now kind of, well, they strongly suggest a definite answer. So, Greg has been much involved in trying to figure out about fundamentally non-computable things. So he has a thing he calls capital omega, which is the halting probability of a universal Turing machine. It's a number that you, where you can never work out um, even, even a, you know, a few digits of that number. It's something which in our, uh, in our way of doing computation, you simply can't, can't compute that number. And so then the question has come up, is the universe like omega that is sort of fundamentally non-computable by yeah that's that's some um, uh, f fundamentally non-computable by um, uh, by our standard kind of uh, a way of thinking about computation or is it instead um, oh yeah that was a that was a cool thing we made for Greg actually um, the uh, uh, was it was it something that um, uh, uh, is it more like pi you know, pi, 3.14159, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Once you know the rule for making pi, it just takes a computer of the kind that we normally have to just generate all those digits. And the question is, is the universe like pi, where something like an ordinary computer could just compute its digits, if uh, compute what happens in the universe with a sufficiently sort of uh, sufficiently much computational effort, or is it like omega, where it's fundamentally not reachable by sort of the notion of computation that we have. Or put another way, is the universe computational or is it sort of hyper-computational? And um, I think, you know, the, the, uh, the, the progress we've made recently in physics very strongly suggests that the universe is, is simply computational and not hyper-computational. Um, that was uh, actually a question from uh, uh, Pietro. Uh, who is asking uh, about hypercomputation? So uh, you, you you just uh, uh, answered. Uh, well, yeah, let me let me say a little bit more about that. Actually, it's kind yes. of kind of interesting. I mean, the you know hypercomputation is, for example, when people think about physics, they often think about solving equations like dif partial differential equations, where there are numbers that have an infinite number of digits, and there are sort of infinitely many numbers with an infinite number of digits. But yet the equation sort of grinds forward, um, sort of uh, uh, in limited time, it manages to work out things that involve infinite numbers of infinite, in, infinite numbers of infinite numbers, so to speak. Um, and in a sense, it, uh, if, if we take the pure sort of calculus type mathematics completely seriously, it would be saying that the universe can compute things that, for example, a Turing machine, a standard model of computation can't compute. Now, if we say, well, how do we actually prepare, you know, that, I don't know, uh, system of billiard balls or something with enough precision to actually be able to use those infinite number of digits that we think physics can compute? Well, that's a challenging thing. We have no idea how to prepare uh, something where the position of the billiard ball is accurate to a million decimal places, for example. Um, and so it's sort of been a, a, a mystery that while, while physics, in the way that it's normally formulated, in a sense, implies hypercomputation. We don't seem to be able to get to it because we just can't prepare things precisely enough to, to lock into whatever hypercomputation might exist. Well, in this model of physics that we have now, there just isn't any hypercomputation. The physics that we are seeing right now is merely an approximation. The thing where we say we're using calculus, which uses continuous numbers and so on, those are merely an approximation in the same way that we might say 
we have a continuous fluid that is, uh, you know, where we can have an arbitrary amount of water. Well, we can't really because water is made of molecules. And at some level, we have to say, do we have 10 molecules or 11 molecules? Um, so, but in, when we have it, enough molecules. Does this, does this represent some bounding condition on the performance of uh, quantum computers uh, that uh, are supposed to be attaining to uh, multiverses uh, and then recombine the result going beyond what uh, traditional computers could do? Yes, I think so. I mean, we don't know for sure, but but one of the things that's really cool in this model of, of physics that we have, I mean, I, I am, um, you know, I, I've used quantum mechanics sort of all my life, so to speak, but I don't think I would ever claim to have understood quantum mechanics. I know how to do computations with quantum mechanics, but until, you know, a couple of months ago, I wouldn't have said that I, in any real sense, understood what quantum mechanics is. I think I now understand much more about what it is, and it's it's very very beautiful actually, but it it um, you know what we what we see is a real picture of how quantum computing how to think about quantum computing how we're sort of treeing out all these possibilities in in quantum processes, but also how in order for us to be able to sense what's going on, we have to kind of corral all those treed out quantum effects. We have to use measurement somehow, quantum measurement, which has always been a little bit of a mysterious part of quantum mechanics, to kind of get back into something where we can say, yes, we know what happened, and it was this. And I am suspecting that the that the formalism we have will give one some some very definite bounds on what's possible in quantum computing. I think that um, in um, uh, the um, uh, well, we have one immediately. There's a you know, there's a speed of light. We know about the speed of light. The speed of light tells us in physical space what's the, um, you know, how quickly can we uh, experience different parts of physical space. We can only at most go at the speed of light to kind of explore different parts of physical space. Well, in this theory of physics that we have, there's this thing that we call branchial space, the space of, of essentially different quantum branches. And there is, just like there's a speed of light, there's also a maximum speed of motion in branchial space, uh, which I've been calling zeta. Um, I picked one of the, I, I had done a survey at one point of which were the most used Greek letters in, um, uh, in scientific kinds of things. And I, I um, zeta was one of the losers. So I've decided that, um, call this zeta because it's different. I was wanted to call it upsilon, but fonts don't treat upsilon very well. Mm -hmm. um, but in any case, the, you know, there's this other sort of constant of nature, which we've, identified, which is this maximum rate of, of motion in branchial space, which is equivalent to a maximum rate of entanglement in quantum mechanics. And that puts a bound on the operation of quantum computers. That bound is probably, probably, but not certainly, uh, far outside the domain of what people are dealing with in labs right now. But the formalism and the way that one is sort of, uh, you know, understanding both this sort of branching and quantum mechanics and subsequent measurement, I think there will be a bunch of bounds there. So it doesn't certainly be better understanding. I think uh, we were just yesterday looking at this question about distributed computing and its comparison to what happens in our models in space time and in quantum mechanics. And um, uh, it, it really seems that there's going to be a, a really beautiful unification of the ideas of general relativity the ideas of quantum mechanics and specifically quantum computing and ideas in distributed computing. It's as if kind of different parts of the universe are computing separately, just as different parts of a distributed computing system are computing separately. And we, when we build our, our model of the world, we define these reference frames, which essentially give sort of, uh, uh, give order to what's happening. And that's similar to what we have to do when we think about how distributed computers work. So anyway, what I'm, what I'm expecting is that in the, in the quantum computing case, I mean, the thing to understand about quantum computing is the, the effort to sort of use physics to make better computers. This is a great effort, and this effort will definitely succeed. The question of to what extent the official quantum brand should go on there, that's a more complicated question. I mean, to what extent the, um, uh, you know, it's funny because I, I worked on quantum computers back in the early 1980s. Uh, along with physicist uh, Dick Feynman, who I, who I knew quite well. Um, and we, we we have rather incompatible ways of working on things, but we were we were working on this problem of, you know, could you were you not a good drummer? Uh, no, I'm not a good drummer. He was, look, he, he was a fantastic hand calculator of things. 
and you know he would do these elaborate hand calculations and he would always would always be telling people oh he's got this intuitive way of figuring things out the fact was he would do a hand calculation and his 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 really most impressive trait as far as i'm concerned was getting the right answer in this in these elaborate hand calculations which he he thought was trivial he he thought the impressive thing was to you know to give this very intuitive explanation um you know i always thought the impressive thing was that he could actually get the right answer by calculating something um but uh, uh you know we we had uh, we were particularly interested in things like how to make perfect quantum randomness and so on. And, you know, we had realized that there were sort of limits on how much you could do that. And I've been sort of suspicious about sort of the measurement process in quantum computing ever since. And I think now we finally have some formalism that's going to allow us to actually, you know, in a, in a more sort of uh, principled way, see what's going on there. Um, it looks like... Uh, uh quantum computing uh, as, a, as a field of endeavor may belong to the same category as artificial intelligence of a somewhat masochistic, self-defeating uh, epistemology where each achievement uh, nullifies uh, uh, the, the definition. Uh, in, in, in AI, whatever we do, oh, that's not AI anymore. And now you are saying that uh, the progress in quantum computing uh, should mean that we don't apply the label quantum computer to the thing that works. Maybe I, I think I think it will actually be the opposite. Uh, actually, it's happened now in AI. AI has become popular, right? So so people so everything is AI now. Um, even things which we used to just say are simple algorithms and so on. It's now you know the AI brand is is a is a is a winning brand. And I, I well, think we, we did live uh, through uh, AI winters uh, uh, in the past, uh, so uh, I think we should prepare for the next one when uh, the uh, over uh, the the excessive promises of VC fueled uh, startups uh, are not going to be uh, realized, uh, and and everybody will retrench. You know, what I think about that is that I think that the, you know, AI is a story of automation and it is the latest brand in this kind of long story of let's take things which humans used to have to do for themselves and let's find ways to automate it. You know, the particulars of neural networks and things like that, which are cool techniques, um, you know, that the rate of sort of spectacular, you know, growth in things like neural nets will level off. I mean, I, you know, it's, it's, we're probably, I would guess we're about two thirds of the way through that, that particular sort of, uh, uh, you know, rapid growth period. I mean, it's, it's you know, the, the neural nets are a methodology, much as things like linear algebra matrices and things were a methodology that would became big in computing in the 1970s and so on. Um, and they allow us to do all kinds of interesting things, which we weren't able to do before. And, you know, the real power um, you know, I think you'd asked earlier about about what um, you know can the kinds of tools we're building help with uh, things like you know help with sort of the the frontier of irreducible computation. The way I would see it is there is there is sort of great power in this in the computational universe, and neural nets are another way to tap that power. The real question is how do we connect the power that the intrinsic power that's available with the things that we humans want to do. How do we define, you know, when, when we start to define our purposes, when we start to define our kind of, uh, you know, what do we care about having happen? Do we care about whether, you know, we're doing a, a video call right now? We care about that. Do we care about having, you know, the three-dimensional video call? Do we care about, you know, what is it that we care about, so to speak? Once, you know, we've got this, this amazing resource in computation, in the computational universe, which parts of it should we mine, so to speak? Mm -hmm. There's a lot there, but um, and that I think is is sort of the story. You know, when you talk about things like I don't know uh, the operation of cities, where you know we've set up certain rules, and then those rules lead to certain behavior. Um, now you know there's a question of uh, now that we have so so for example, given computation, okay, there was a time when the way to get people around, the best way to get people around was to have trains that run at periodic times. That was kind of the you know the model of a hundred years ago or more for sort of the way things should work. Now, subsequently, we've got more you know the the uh, uh, you know the taxi on demand, so to speak, or later maybe the self-driving car on demand, where it's no longer just this the best way to organize things is with this sort of low computation effort 
where you're just saying the trains will run on time periodically once every 10 minutes or once an hour or something. Instead, it's this much more computationally elaborate system where you're you know, trying to optimize all of these different things. And the question then is, you know, when we imagine something like a city and when we imagine sort of the design of the city, so to speak, to what extent can we leverage more of the computational universe? I mean, if we know up front that we're going to have, you know, if we know that the city can only work by having trains that run once an hour, then we're going to build, you know, train tracks through it in such and such a way and so on. And we're going to worry about whether people can get to the train in this way and that way. If we think at the next level of sort of computational sophistication and we say it's all going to be self-driving cars zipping from here to there, you know, we don't really need traffic lights anymore because, you know, the self-driving cars are going to be communicating with each other and it's going, that's going to optimize this and that. We don't really need, you know, such large roads because once we have, you know, communication between the self-driving cars, there won't be traffic jams. I don't know. But these are, you know, when you ask how there's sort of a, an interesting interplay between the things that we manage to build as technology and the way that we manage to build our world, so to speak. And, it, you know, it, it, the, the, the way I think about AI these days is uh, uh, successive uh, abstraction layers of, of learnability. I have at least four, maybe five of learning, learning to learn, learning to learn to learn, and so on. Uh, where uh, the example uh, is uh, Google's uh, uh, AlphaGo uh, it, that w learned to play Go uh, from a, uh, a library of uh, human plays, contrary to IBM's uh, uh, Deep Blue that was taught to play um, chess. Then uh, AlphaGo uh, Zero would learn to learn to play Go because it didn't use the library of or the database of previous uh, human plays. And then Alpha Zero would learn to learn to learn because it was able to apply learnability to three separate um, games, chess, uh, Go, and uh, Shoju, in each becoming uh, very rapidly superhuman because all of this was obtained with the decreasing amount of resources and, and radically shorter times. And so the next step is going to be to learn, to learn, to learn, to learn, where those different modules are going to be able to transfer uh, uh, and, and have an observational point as, if, as it were above the horizon and compare and then, and then say, okay, whatever I achieved here is applicable there and so on. You, you know, what's complicated about that situation is the story of computational irreducibility. Because at some point, you hit the point where it's not possible to learn what will happen. It's an irreducible thing. So what you're effectively doing when you're talking about learning to learn, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you're saying, we have built a world in which we have games like Go and so on, and they have certain features. And there are things that are learnable because of the world we've built, so to speak. And it's a, uh, you know, what you're effectively saying is the contours of the world we've built can be explored and they can be explored more efficiently. It kind of relates also to humans and sort of, uh, you know, one of the questions that I'm always curious about with humans is, you know, what is the, what, what, is, what is the education of the future, for example? I mean, you talk about machines learning to learn to learn. You know, uh, we humans, to some extent, have learned to learn to learn. Yes, I mean, we've, we've um, you know, we get, you know, a lot of the progress of sort of uh, intellectual history has been about these layers of abstraction that essentially give us, allow us to sort of um, jump further in one go because we have a higher level of abstraction. And I think that the, um, uh, you know, one of, one of the questions you might ask about the modern world is, you know, is it the case that from here on out, there's just going to be more and more and more to learn? And I think the answer is that what we're seeing is more automation and more abstraction. And I think what tends to happen is that as we build out our world and as we figure out what we need to learn in education, there's sort of a, a constant uh, size of frontier of what, um, because below the frontier, things have been either automated or abstracted away, but there's this frontier of things that, that we need to learn and we need to figure out to sort of build the next steps in constructing our world, so to speak. Because, I mean, I think, you know, if you look at one of the things I'm curious about is sort of the meta uh, development of, of humans 
and you know, if you ask what are our purposes today, they're pretty different from some of the purposes a thousand, two thousand years ago. Some of them are the same. Some of them are sort of biologically determined and absolutely the same. Um, others come about because of the structure of society, the structure of beliefs, the structure of abstractions that we have, um, and and have evolved quite a bit. And I think that's a you know this question of how that continues to evolve is is a really interesting one. And you know I think you're right that that there are you know we we build certain platforms, we build certain levels. And those levels allow us to go on. The platforms we build have a certain arbitrariness to them. It didn't, for example, in mathematics, we built certain abstractions. We didn't need to build those exact abstractions. There, there were details of those abstractions that were historical accidents. But once we built that abstraction, the next abstractions we build are determined by what we can reach from that particular sort of milestone. Um, and it's not, you know, uh, and so the, there's a there's a certain inexorability about it because we built out this particular thing. I think it's the same with kind of human society and the kinds of things that we think are worth doing. Um, Babele is asking um, that it, he, to him it looks like uh, uh, the physics project is like L system on steroids. I don't know what L system is. I, I do. I can I can I can answer that. The the um, yeah L systems were. Uh, actually, an idea that's been invented and reinvented many times. The the L comes from Aristotle Lindenmeyer, who I met years ago, who was a, a, a primarily a botanist actually, who was interested in the growth of plants, and he was interested in in um, uh, kind of the way in which plants grow, kind of tree-like structures, and he had this kind of way of uh, this sort of formal system for describing how things would grow based on uh, well, a typical thing way you would think about it is, imagine a text editor where you have a string of characters and you keep on uh, redoing the, um, uh, yeah, those are, uh, those are nice L system growing plants. The, they've, they've been in many movies and things like that. The, um, I think that um, uh, the, the, the way that, um, so anyway, the, the, the typical kind of L system is you take a string of characters and you apply some rule that says if you see a set of characters, if you see a character that if you see an A, replace it by B A A, for example. If you see a B, replace it by A C A or something like that. And that kind of way of uh, repeatedly replacing things um, gives you uh, a, um, uh, it, it typically builds these kind of tree like structures. Um, so the thing that we're doing is a, is a system a bit like that. Um, actually, the uh, sort of a uh, okay in the, in the world of L systems, there are things called zero L systems, which are the ones that just branch out like trees. Um, those are the things that are most commonly studied. There are things like one L and two L systems that have different amounts of context that they're using. Uh, those have been much much less studied. They're much more complicated and they're much less studied. Um, we've actually used those as a simplified version of some of the systems that we're looking at, um, and. Uh, the, the main system that we're looking at is essentially a hypergraph rewriting system where instead of having strings of characters, you have hypergraphs and you're, um, uh, you're, you're saying that um, uh, when you see a little piece of hypergraph that looks like this, rewrite it to one that looks like this. So in, in that sense, this is, uh, um, it, uh, you, yes, it is not incorrect to say it's like an, it's like sort of an L system on steroids, but the thing to realize about all of these um, models of computation, Turing machines, cellular automata, uh, sort of sophisticated L systems, the zero L systems don't quite make it, but the, the you know, one L, two L systems do make it. Um, the remarkable thing is, um, uh, is that all these different underlying models of computation are all in the end equivalent. That was the thing that was completely unobvious. I mean, when Gödel did his proof, what he essentially did was to show that you can compile tons of stuff into arithmetic into statements in arithmetic. Then Turing came along and said, well, actually, you can compile all the stuff to this particular model of Turing machines. Church, Alonzo Church, um, did the same thing talking about lambda calculus. Then there were these other models. And what became clear only very slowly, I mean, it really took about 50 years for this to be truly clear. And, and I would argue, even right now, it's we finally got the last sort of piece of making that clear. The question is, is every reasonable computation equivalent in the way that it works. So it could be the case. I mean, Turing 
didn't think that Turing machines were truly universal. He thought they were models of certain kinds of things. Gödel didn't think that the system he built was truly universal. He has a lovely footnote where he says, but minds, like human minds, may be doing something different. You know, they're not subject to the same structure. Turing suspected something similar. You know, it, it, uh, and, and in fact, you know, the physics of the time and for a long time looked different. It looked like it wasn't in this bucket of capability that corresponded to computation as we knew it. So the really, uh, and, and, it, and it's still, you know, with the, the, the model of physics that we now have, if that model really pans out, as I'm really fairly sure it's going to, um, the, uh, then we have nailed it. Then we know that our physical universe is simply a computer in the same way that Gödel effectively imagined it with his general recursive functions, in the same way that Turing imagined it with his Turing machines, and so on. And that's a, uh, you know, I think that the, um, the thing that um, uh, somebody was asking about hypercomputers before, um, and I was talking about their, their role in physics, um, one of the features of our universe, if our universe is purely computational, if you sort of throw a hypercomputer into the mix, you will have essentially a, a cosmic event horizon between our universe and anything that is associated with a hypercomputer. There will be no way to essentially communicate. It'll be like, like an, a, an event horizon, like in a black hole, where you just can't get causal effects propagating between our universe and the sort of hypercomputational universe. And that's, that's, um, that's a, a really weird thing. Okay. Uh, uh, Russ is asking uh, uh, if exploring the computational uh, universe, including uh, the, the rule space uh, of uh, the, the physics project, should be done uh, uh, with, with, with guided um, activities, uh, uh, or uh, it could be done randomly. Or uh, let me add to uh, add the third strategy. Uh, are you using some kind of machine learning approach where candidates uh, are are bubbling up? Right. So, I mean, you know, I would say that in a perfect world, we'd run a sort of universe at home project and we just uh, recruit, you know, tens of millions of computers and it would just be a question of running it and checking whether you've got the universe. I hope we're going to get to that point. What I've done so far, what we've done so far has been, the problem is, it's hard to expect the unexpected, so to speak. It's um, uh, what, you know, you look at all these different sort of candidate universes and you say, I've got a theory for what they're all gonna do. And in my experience, the number one meta fact is you're always wrong. Mm -hmm. And it's very humiliating in a sense. You know, I've been studying the computational universe for 40 years. Uh, statistically, I, there are so many more ways of being wrong than being right that uh, it will be the case, even though you have that intuition. Yeah, right. Very proud of right, right, but but no. So I mean, in practice, in this actual project, I I you know the thing that I've always ended up doing is you just run these systems, you see what they do, and you know your best chance of figuring out anything interesting is you as a human look at them. But now you know I've got a little bit of assistance. I've got analytical techniques, and I've also got machine learning, and I certainly have used machine learning even in this project over the last few months. Uh, feature space you know, arranging these universes in a feature space and being able to look at, like I was interested in looking through 79 million universes, okay? So looking at 79 million pictures is, uh, that's a lot of work. But 79 million pictures where they've been arranged, um, where each screen has been arranged by machine learning in this feature space, that's much more doable. And you can, and I found like these weird outliers that the machine learning system Weren't, um, and by the way, that was kind of an amusing case because the machine learning system was trained by looking at 50 million images of the world, right? It, we, I was using the feature space system that we built for image identification. And so in a sense, it was doing something very much like what my brain does. You know, I've been trained, my brain has been trained to recognize the kinds of things that exist in the world. And notably, those kinds of things that exist in the world are a mixture of things that nature has delivered to us and things that our engineering has chosen to create. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's kind of a fun uh, thing because it's like I've got a direct sort of cognitive boost from the fact that I've got this neural network that has learned from the same kinds of things that, that, that I've learned from. And, but you, know, you mentioned biological evolution earlier. And one of the things that I find interesting about this physics project is what we've got 
is a is a class of, of very structuralist systems to study that are sort of potentially models for lots of things. And it's just like I studied cellular automata, which are just these, these lines of, let's say, black and white cells with very simple rules that determine, you know, what the next line of cells will look like. This is cellular automata have turned out to have all kinds of applications that I never imagined, all kinds of things about, you know, consensus and blockchains or, you know, road traffic flow and all, all kinds of things that, that, and in a sense, that is a feature of the fact that they are minimal models. They're models that are as structuralist as possible. So you can, so they end up being the underpinning of, of lots of different kinds of things. Well, in fact, these models that we have for physics, we built them for physics, but actually it's turning out, I mentioned distributed computing as, a, as an application area. Um, uh, it, it's um, another potential application area, I think, is biological evolution. I think that one of the things that's been missing in biological evolution is kind of a, a global meta theory of the process of evolution. You know, it's always uh, when you talk about, you know, evolutionary processes, one of the kind of, one of the hacks is you say, I'm doing, I'm running a round of natural selection. Okay, what do I keep after that round of natural selection? Do I keep just the winner? Do I keep the top five winners? You know, what do I really keep? How does that really work? How do we think about this globally? I have this slight suspicion that, we're going to be able to use this, this set of models as a kind of uh, a way to get sort of more of a meta theory of evolution. And in fact, that we may find that things like, okay, so this is, this is the first time I'm mentioning this particular weird idea. That, All right, go uh, ahead. Um, that it will turn out that speciation is related to event horizons. So in other words, that um, the presence of sort of things that can be thought of as being causally broken are similar to the way that event horizons develop in space time. Anyway, that that's a that's a potential coming attraction. Sounds that's, good. The, um, um, uh, one of those handles that you also have a, a hard time uh, pronouncing uh, is 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 asking if uh, people uh, will become obsolete uh, at least with the past uh, uh, tools. And and I would say that the answer is, of course not because people will be obsolete, but the tools are going to be, and the new tools are the ones that you are offering for anybody to, to employ. Yeah, well, I, I think that the thing to understand is the, the part that doesn't become obsolete for people is what do you want to do? No machine is going to be, you know, we will have, and, and this, is a, this is a little bit of a scary thing that's happening right now. I mean, you know, people wonder, do the machines take over because, you know, the Terminators start blowing everybody up? Or do the machines take over because it's like the GPS is in our cars where we just punch in the destination and you know we just follow the GPS? It's not for me to think about which way I'm going to go. I'm just going to follow the GPS. And over time, you know, we will gradually have you know lots of things that are sort of auto-suggesting, you know, gosh, you know, you haven't eaten for a while. Maybe you should eat something now, or you have um, you know, maybe you should be talking to this person about this. Maybe you should be doing this, maybe you should be doing that. So there's this kind of mechanism of auto-suggestion. And, and the question is, where do those auto-suggestions come from? How do they get sourced? What is that? And, and in a sense, the whole story of, you know, and this relates to kind of the whole issue of sort of the corporate world versus the, you know, versus ethics versus et cetera. I mean, it's a, it's a complicated uh, mixture of things where it's like, okay, for example, you might say, well, I want suggestions to make me the best possible me I can be. What on earth does that mean? Yeah. That's like, I want to make, tell the AIs, I want the AIs to make the world the best world it can be. What do I actually say? You know, I was, I was um, this idea of computational irreducibility, which sort of was born out of, um, uh, you know, thinking about uh, sort of very abstract things, I think is increasingly a thing you really have to think about and worry about in the practical world. I mean, like last summer, I happened to um, uh, do some testimony for the US Senate about um, the question of, of sort of how do you tell whether, uh, whether uh, content selection businesses, I called them, you know, uh, social networks, search engines, things like that, that are essentially taking content from around the internet and delivering it to people. How do you, you know, there's this question of, you know, when it's going to deliver content to you, what content should it deliver? How should it rank the things it delivers? What should it choose to block? What should it, what should it, uh, you know, how does it, how does it try and deliver the best things to me? And so there's sort of the question of, is something shocking happening 
in the innards of the AI systems that are delivering that content. And so, you know, one idea is, well, let's just open up the AI system and see what's inside and certify that nothing bad is in there. Well, you know, there could be so, like crazy trivial bad things in there, you know, an if statement that says, you know, if it's if it's David block it type thing or something like this. But but most of the time there'll be, you know, neural network kinds of things, other sorts of things that are, um, that are uh, and what one realizes is that computational irreducibility is is sticking its neck out in this in this place. It's kind of it's because of computational irreducibility. Just because you know what the rules were that allowed you to do that content selection doesn't mean you can immediately say so. Nothing bad is going to happen. Um, and uh, in fact, what I realized, you know, I, I was I was very uh, kind of um, uh, I was I was not very happy with the fact that I was like ending up having to say, look, these schemes that you're coming up with for making laws that say, you know, people should audit what's inside, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, they're just never going to work. And they're not going to work because of essentially what boils down to Gödel's theorem, computational irreducibility, these kinds of things. Um, you know, this is a place where, you know, is one of the places where we're starting to see, you know, that the selection of content for us to see is a place where AI directly affects people's everyday lives. And this is sort of the first skirmish in what is essentially the beginning of the kind of some kind of AI war or something that that that's going to end up happening. And I think that, you know, it is a very interesting thing that ideas like computational irreducibility are starting to be important for kind of uh, the way we think about the future of our of our society and so on. And I think the, um, uh, you know, in a sense, my solution uh, to this problem of content selection is a very human solution. I mean, I think the I think the only way it's going to work is to essentially have um, uh, I was calling them ranking providers and things like that to be able to basically say I want I'm going to have this AI that has learnt the preferences of some organization, some brand, some entity that for whatever reason I trust or want to know the, the the ranking from. And to glue that together with the sort of the AI pipelines of uh, places that are delivering, you know, dealing with billions of pieces of content and so on, I think sort of injecting the humans back into the loop is sort of the only way you can solve things. And, um, the, you know, uh, hoping that the algorithm is going to solve it and it's just going to be, you know, we'll, we'll let the AIs take over is, is, it's just not going to work. Well, uh, uh, what we maximize for must be made explicit. Uh, a, a recent example is that we have been maximizing for the efficiency of global supply chains without uh, uh, caring for their brittleness. Uh, and uh, with the pandemic lockdown, we realized that maybe that wasn't the best thing to maximize for. So similarly, uh, having uh, 10 million things uh, to be recommended is useless anyway if I have a limited human time to watch the Netflix queue or read the books on Amazon and so on. And uh, as a consequence, being conscious that reintroducing the human factor will uh, slow it down, but make it more human compatible is not uh, is not a bad idea, actually. Yeah, I mean, uh, okay. Alex, Alex Lightman, who uh, was uh, together with me, the organizer of H Plus Summit, is also saying hello. Hi. And uh, I want uh, to bring up this uh, question that I think it is very important, and, and you do have some answers from Pietro, who is asking, uh, what are uh, the experimentally uh, provable uh, consequences of the physics project right. that could make it uh, uh, different from uh, general relativity or, or quantum mechanics uh, uh, and and uh, give it the the winner, make it the winner. Right. Well, I think the thing that you know Einstein really lucked out with general relativity because the the um, he had a prediction that didn't involve some external scale. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he had his cosmological constant, which he didn't know the value of, and he couldn't really make sort of immediately observable predictions from. In fact, he failed to make the prediction that the universe would expand, which was the immediate thing his theory told him. Um, but that's sort of a, a uh, you know, he lucked out with the prediction that the bending of light around the sun will be twice what it would be with uh, the traditional gravity. 
Um, the, one of the challenges in these theories is the question of scales. There are parameters in the theory, and depending on how those parameters come out, um, one might end up with something that one can readily observe, one might end up with something that's very hard to observe. Um, I think, for example, this maximum entanglement speed that I mentioned, um, that depends what the actual value is. My initial estimate is it might be 10 to the 5 solar masses per second. That's a very big number. That's, uh, you know, 100,000 solar masses being, um, being entangled per second. Now, at that size, if, if, it was, if that was a correct estimate, and it might be bigger than that, it might be smaller than that, if that was a correct estimate, if we were lucky enough to see a merger of black holes from the center of galaxies, we would see an effect from that. Um, and uh, you know, we would see essentially a, a difference from the way that the, the limit on the entanglement speed, maximum entanglement speed, uh, would be another limit on the way the merger could happen different from the, from the implications of, of standard general relativity. I think there also um, are potential places where the merger of, of relativity and quantum mechanics that this theory implies may be visible, particularly in connection with black holes. There's one possibility that we're just starting to look at to do with correlations between photons in orbit around black holes. Now, of course, there isn't, you know, you don't have black holes sort of available in your average lab, so that makes it a more difficult thing. But I think there's going to be some, possibly some scale-free predictions there that are sort of inevitable consequences of the of the merger of quantum mechanics and, and relativity, uh, qu quantum mechanics and relativity that, that, that the theory suggests. Now, there are other things, like here's another one. So in this theory, there is uh, the electron, for example, is no longer a point particle, but it's uh, actually quite big on the scale of the elementary length in the universe. And that suggests that there can exist particles that are much lighter than the electron, like maybe 10 to the 20 times lighter than the electron. That's not something that we've ever had a reason to think might exist in a theory before. It's not impossible in existing theories. You know, you could put a, uh, you know, even in the standard model, you could add a particle which has that feature, but there's no real reason to think, there's no real reason to imagine that particles like that exist. This theory gives us a good reason to think that particles like that might exist, and maybe they're highly relevant to things like dark matter and so on. Um, again, there's a bunch of astrophysics that has to be done to work out exactly what consequences the kinds of particles that this theory implies would have for astrophysics. Um, and that's a, that's a non-trivial thing to do. I would say that the, um, uh, some of the interesting consequences of, of this model are, in a sense, theoretical predictions. They're things about the, the commonality between different kinds of theories that exist and so on. I mean, it's, a, it's sort of an interesting and strange thing to imagine that string theory, which has never been successfully connected to sort of a theory of the universe, might actually be part of the validation of our theory of the universe in the sense that it, it has the right feel for certain aspects of physics, and the fact that we can connect to it should be viewed as a positive sign for our theory. So it's sort of a strange form of validation um, that comes by sort of theoretical prediction in a sense. But, you know, I think it's going to be the case that um, uh, there will be, you know, from general relativity, general relativity was invented in 1915. Um, its first uh, really, um, you know, it, it sort of had predicted the, the expansion of the universe, but Einstein kind of squashed that by introducing the cosmological constant. Um, but then the expansion of the universe was observed, even though Einstein had set his theory up so it wouldn't make the universe expand. But then the real understanding of the implications of general relativity took 50 years. I mean, the understanding that black holes were a real thing, you know, maybe in the 1940s that began to be something, but it was in, the, it took until the 1960s before there was any real understanding of black holes as a real phenomenon that you could observe and not some coordinate singularity in the theory and so on. I mean, it's difficult going from underlying theories to things you can actually measure. And the, you know, the success of gravitational wave detection was absolutely spectacular, but um, you know, it, it took a long time to get to that point. And, 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 and you have been lucky not to be a, a, a professional physicist uh, for the past 30 years because you would be so frustrated with, with nothing coming out. Uh, and, and now uh, with the uh, LHC, uh, they are upgrading and they are desperate because they are not showing any 
any mysteries. They are not stumbling on on, on, on new mysteries. Yeah, I think one of the things I'm sort of hopeful about, and we're not there yet, is that this theory will suggest bizarre kinds of measurements to do that will mm -hmm. lead to interesting things. I mean, you know, the idea of taking a particle accelerator and just accelerating those protons and electrons, you know, the methods of acceleration have been kind of the same for 50 years, and we're just getting higher and higher energies, and that's that's cool, but um, it's still, the structure of the experiments has been fairly similar. I mean, there have been a bunch of experiments that have been done looking for sort of dark matter candidates, looking for things in cosmology that are different kinds of experiments. I think one of the things that I'm hoping is that some of the things we've done will suggest absolutely bizarre kinds of experiments that haven't been tried before, where one could start um, to see uh, effects that, um, uh, you know, I, I have to say, when one is in the business of, you know, theories and are they right, are they wrong, and so on and so on and so on, um, it's, uh, you know, I, I, well, I used to do sort of standard physics, so to speak, and I prided myself on always having the right intuition about which theories would be right and which theories wouldn't be right. And sometimes, you know, you say, well, just watch the experiments. They decide what theories are right and what theories are wrong. I remember one, when I was doing particle physics, one of the early calculations that I did on the basis of QCD, quantum chromodynamics theory of quarks and gluons, was I made some prediction, and there was an experiment that said that prediction can't be right. I was pretty sure about this prediction, and I kind of, I wrote this paper where half of it was this is the prediction, the other half was here's why it might be wrong, because the experiment says it's wrong. And of course, you know, I'm telling the story because it turns out the experiment was wrong. It was a difficult experiment. It observed nothing. Always a suspicious thing in experiments when they observe nothing, um, mm -hmm. because you know it's hard to know whether you were right that there was nothing there. And so, you know, I think it's it's worth understanding, you know, sort of the experimental this idea that science is just determined by experiments. It's a tricky thing. There's a force of theory. I think, you know, for example, take Newton. You know, Newton wrote this whole Principia book. Um, that, uh, you know, uh, talked about the universal law of gravity that he invented in 1665 when he was uh, holed up outside of Cambridge because there was a plague going on. But, um, uh, you know, he invented this law of gravity and it made predictions. And so one of the things he tried to predict was uh, the motion of the moon. And, you know, he has this long chapter. He's working out all this mathematics for the, you know, motion of the moon. And the last sentence is, I think it's, but the apse of the moon is twice as great. In other words, he got the, the wrong answer by a factor of two. Now, did he give up on his theory? No, he didn't. He, he thought that his theory had enough force of theoretical coherence that even though that calculation came out wrong, um, that, uh, you know, that the theory would, would, uh, would go forward. And so that's a, it's a, you know, often the calculation of the consequence of theories is quite complicated. And um, I'm sort of, I, as I say, my, my best hope is that there will be suggestions of experiments to try things like these things I call oligons, which are these, these uh, very light particles. Um, that's a, a, a thing suggested by this theory. Um, maybe also there will be suggestions about the um, uh, perturbations left in the cosmic microwave background that are sort of a, a scar from the very, very earliest stages of the universe. Um, if, we're, if we're really lucky, the real sort of science fiction thing to happen, which I don't think is going to happen, is that the very first uh, updates in the history of the universe that are sort of the from the very, very, very beginning of the universe, when you know in these models with hypergraphs and things, when the first hypergraph update happens, that there will be some sort of uh, some shadow of that first update that will be visible in the cosmic microwave background. And so in a sense, the, the, like the instructions for the universe will be written across the whole time. I don't think it's going to happen that way. Like but. in the original Macintosh, uh, uh, the, 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 the engineers uh, signed the, the backplate, uh, that would be the signature. Right. Um, Alex uh, is asking a, a yes, no question. Um, have you read uh, these uh, science fiction books uh, where uh, uh, the protagonist is upgraded to be a human wolf from Alpha? I have not. No. I'm All right. Not. There you go. I love science fiction, so there is one for us to to, to read. Right. And then, and then Pietro is asking about uh, P versus NP. On one hand, where do you stand? And and on the other hand. Um, does the fact that the universe uh, applies multigraph rules non-deterministically play any role? Right. 
Very interesting question. A uh, young physicist who's been working on this project named Jonathan Gorard actually thinks he has made some rather interesting progress in the P versus NP question. Um, I mean, there are two versions of that question. One is in the universe, and the other is in an axiomatic system of mathematics. What I have suspected is that P versus MP may be independent of the axioms of standard mathematics. That is, the question of whether, so, so one of the things I've looked at is P versus MP, it's like you have a Turing machine, uh, there's certain computations it can do deterministically in polynomial time. And there are other computations, like multiplying numbers might be an example of that. There are other computations that it can do non-deterministically in polynomial time in the sense that it has to tree out lots of possibilities and checking which checking each of those possibilities is doable quickly, but the treeing out can involve potentially exponentially many possibilities. And so the big question, the P versus MP question, is is it the case that there's some way to sort of corral all this treeing out of possibilities to be something that can be successfully done quickly in a single sort of in a single thread of computation. Well, so I was interested in this and I realized there's sort of an empirical way to answer that question. You just say, you know, what you say, what are the possible algorithms that you could use to solve that NP complete problem, for example? Let's just enumerate the possible algorithms. We can do that by just enumerating the possible Turing machines, for instance, and just seeing how fast do they run on these different computations. And the thing that you realize when you do that, the, the most significant thing you realize is you might think, oh, we're going to have these two smooth curves, and one of them will be going like polynomially, the other one will be going up much more quickly, and so on. And we'll easily be able to say, oh, you know, there's a, um, uh, you know, we'll easily be able to get to the answer. We'll easily be able to say, uh, that uh, you know the the NP curve is going up more quickly than the P curve. Okay, what you actually see on the ground is these things wiggle around like crazy, and you say, what's the limit going to be? Well, it may be very hard to determine what that limit is because the, the all these curves are wiggling around like crazy. It looks very much like the kinds of problems that we actually uh, have really good reason to believe are independent of the axioms of arithmetic. That they're things where you can set them up as questions which you can ask in the framework of standard mathematics, but where the axiomatic system, the system of things that we assume about mathematics, simply never reaches the point where we can answer that. So that's that's one version of P versus MP is the axiomatic version. The other version of P versus MP is in our universe. Is P, uh, you know, is, what what is the comparison between P and NP? And I think we may have something to say about this. I think that the... Um, uh, there's sort of a very interesting interplay between uh, non-deterministic computation and quantum computation in our model. They are really they're really conflated in a way that um, that Jonathan thinks he's made progress in in really understanding what one can do with that. That the that this this sort of treeing out of possibilities in quantum mechanics that exists in our model is reduced to essentially a treeing out of the kind that a non-deterministic Turing machine does and that there will be some mathematical connection between those. But that's a, that's a coming attraction. Maybe there'll be some live streams where, where we explore that, um, uh, but we don't know yet. Mark is asking uh, if uh, uh, the um, physics project leads to uh, a Riemann metric in 3D or an emergent metric. Right, so, so on these things like hypergraphs, there is the large scale limit of a hypergraph could be something that looks like three-dimensional space. It could be utterly wild and not have any limit that we recognize. But it can also be something where if you look at, for example, distances on the graph, by distances on the graph, I mean just go from one point in the graph to another point through edges in the graph, then it could be that the sort of the, the rules for how that works will correspond to the rules for three-dimensional space. Uh, we know examples where it does. Uh, we know examples where it corresponds to 2.7 dimensional space. We know examples where it corresponds to all sorts of different, um, different limiting structures. We know examples where it has curvature in space. Uh, we know all kinds of examples. Uh, right now, we, you know, the big challenge is can we find, we, we have maybe five properties that we're really looking for in a serious candidate rule for physics. And uh, you know, each one of those five properties, we can find rules that have them. And one of those properties is, 
uh, eventually limits to something like three-dimensional space. Mm -hmm. uh, but we can't find a single, we haven't found yet, a single rule that has all of those properties. Now, having said that, one of the things that's tricky about the dimensionality of space is right now we seem to live in more or less a three-dimensional space, you know, th three dimensions of space, one dimension of time. Um, we don't know whether that was true in the early universe. In fact, in this model, it is quite possible to have an early universe that essentially has infinite numbers of dimensions, where gradually as the universe kind of cools down, it has fewer and fewer dimensions eventually ending up with three. Um, and we don't even know whether in our universe there aren't small perturbations in dimension. In fact, it may be that one could reformulate general relativity, which is usually talked about in terms of the curvature of space-time, that we could reformulate that in terms of small changes of the dimension of space. We don't know that because the mathematics around that really just, just hasn't been developed. And so, you know, the, the, uh, uh, this question of, you know, if should we get the three for the dimension of space out immediately? Not so obvious because the correct rule could be one that runs for 10 to the 100 steps before it sort of cools down to the point where it has something like three dimensional space. So that's a, that's a, you know, that's a remaining uh, thing. But, but from a purely mathematical point of view, yes, the limits of these hypergraphs can correspond to Riemannian manifolds in three plus one dimensional space time. Uh, string theory has been criticized because of an epistemological fault, uh, according to the critics, uh, that uh, uh, the, the, there are so many th theories to pick from that whatever experiment you run, you will find the theory that corresponds to that kind of experiment. Is the physics project uh, similar or, or different? Because you are exploring yeah. a, a, a very, very large, if not infinite, um, rule space, uh, and, and then you can map uh, the candidates against the universe. Uh, okay. So the yeah. surprise has been that the, at the layer of the sort of computationally irreducible layer of all the micro details, then there are many different kinds of things that can happen depending on the underlying rule. The big surprise has been at this layer level above that of computational reducibility, it is incredibly constrained. That is, you know, the fact that quantum mechanics works the way it does, relativity works the way it does, we don't have any choice. You know, it's not like, it's not like we can say, well, put it this way, for example, for relativity, if our space-time is finite dimensional, it has to work this way. It mm -hmm. has to obey Einstein's equations, no choice. Mm -hmm. if, the, um, if the structure of uh, branchial space is the way uh, it seems to be, it has to follow the Feynman path integral. It doesn't have any choice. So you know, at that level, um, there's, uh, there's not a lot of choice. Now, if you say, is the electron muon mass ratio determined? That we don't know yet, and my guess is, my guess right now, my guess has been that, um, that that's something that depends on the underlying rule. But I think there are some things like, for example, well, actually, we're, we're about to this afternoon, and I, I probably um, um, the, um, um, uh, do um, a discussion about quantum angular momentum. And the big, the big mystery there is, well, we don't know. In our model, we're very pleased with the fact that we think we understand what energy and momentum are. And we can derive things like e equals mc squared and so on, which is pretty cool because those haven't been derivable before. And it's not like the model has a lot of choice. It couldn't be e equals, you know, three times mc squared. It's, it's you know, it's, it's, that's what it says. Um, now, we don't know yet what angular momentum is. Um, and I think we might, might, if we're really lucky, we might figure that out this afternoon. Um, and I think we're close. And, and then the big question is, angular momentum, unlike linear momentum, angular momentum is quantized for mm -hmm. particles. So an electron has half h bar of angular momentum. And that leads us into all these questions about, um, uh, well, electrons are fermions that have these very specific properties and so on. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm, I'm, my guess is that you know, if we can figure out what angular momentum is, if we figure out why it's quantized, we will have a whole bunch of no choice kinds of results um, and uh, you like know falling into place right I mean I think that the thing that's just super surprising to me I mean I had no idea that there would be such a, a sort of elegant and connected theory of all these different parts of physics I, I just I, you know it's completely unexpected to me and at this point uh, I mean I'm 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 extremely confident 
that, you know, that it's going to end up, you know, that we're not going to run into something. See, one thing that happened in string theory. So string theory, uh, you know, is a funny story. I was, which I, you know, when I did physics back in, in the day, I sort of saw string theory in between uh, string theory epoch one and string theory epoch two. String theory was originally developed as a theory of the strong interactions, as a theory of the forces that hold nuclei together. And it was an interesting mathematical theory, and it was completely wrong. Um, string theory then, when people started getting interested in quantum gravity, particularly in the 1980s, string theory got kind of rerun. And the string theory we have today is the string theory that came out of uh, trying to study uh, a theory of, of quantum gravity. And what happened in string theory is it ran into these things that said, oh, space should be 26 dimensional, space should be 10 dimensional, whatever. Um, and then it sort of had to, it had to adapt itself to that apparently completely wrong prediction. The thing so far that's happened in our physics project, and I don't know, we may, we may run into some horrible thing just this afternoon, but, but um, I, I'm not expecting it, um, is that you know, we haven't run into any one of these things where it's like, oh my gosh, the theory really implies this. We have to kind of do backflips to make the theory still work um, uh, and be potentially applicable to the universe. So that's some, um, uh, you know, it's, that's the big surprise to me. I mean, I really thought there would be so many more places where it's like, well, maybe it works that way, but it's kind of, you know, we have to sort of uh, squiggle around um, to be able to, to match our theory with what physics says. It's been much more, um, it, you know, things, that, things have gone much better than I expected. Let's take the last question from Ross. Uh, um, he's asking a meta question, which is which is good. Um, and, and and I don't know what uh, class four rule spaces are. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you can you can maybe reformulate the question and then answer it. Um, so I mean, so the answer. Oh, gosh. Um, so. I identified in, in these things called cellular automata, these simple programs, these different overall classes of behavior, of whether they behave in a very simple way, whether they behave in a very sort of random way, whether they behave in a way where there is complexity, but it is identifiable complexity. It has little particle-like things that are that are running around in, in, the, um, in the cellular automaton. And um, uh, the, the way that particles we think work in the physics project is similar to the way that particles work in those cellular automata. Unfortunately, it is vastly more technically complicated because while it's pretty easy to see some patch of bits in a, in a regular array that move in a certain fashion, when you have one of these hypergraphs and you're saying there's a, there's a sort of localized structure that maintains its identity as it propagates through the hypergraph, it's a vastly more complicated uh, sort of thing. And it, it, it sort of a, it requires I don't know. I was in, in past years. I've been sort of interested in understanding it from from graph theory, and I think uh, you know, asking one of the world's graph theory experts some of these questions. You know, he said, "Look, it's it's the direction that graph theory is going, but if you want to know the answer to that, come back in a hundred years." Um, <laughs> so it's some. Um, uh, you know, we have to kind of we we have to bash through that. I'm afraid it's one of the um, uh, sort of there's a there's a lot of very very beautiful mathematics to be done around this physics project. And you know, to get to the physics answer, we have to kind of uh, bash through that mathematics in a very, in a very hacky way. There'll be beautiful mathematics that can be filled in around it, and may, maybe we'll need some of that to be able to get to where we're going to. But I think the answer is, um, with respect to you know, is this a story of getting you know, uh, class four systems? Yes, to some extent it is. Um, uh, yeah, there's a there's a great list of um, uh, of things. I mean, these are you know, these are not your average uh, homework problems, so to speak. Uh, these are big, um, uh, you know, these are big things. And we're, we're um, uh, I, I'm, I think the thing that's super encouraging, I mean, you know, in releasing this physics project, well, first of all, now in the middle of a pandemic, that's a really weird thing. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I didn't know how much people would or wouldn't be interested in this because it's like, does it make an everyday difference to our lives to know the fundamental theory of physics? Answer, well, no, not really. Um, does it make a philosophical difference to know that our universe is computational? Maybe it does. Maybe that really does make a difference. But I think that the, um, uh, the thing that has been very clear last week or so, which is really cool, is that you know a lot more people than I thought 
really are interested in this question. What is the fundamental theory of physics? And you know, some of those people um, either immediately or maybe in the future when they've uh, uh, learned more and so on, um, I hope we'll be able to contribute to this. I mean, to me, it's kind of a, a you know, we're trying to climb a Mount Everest of science, so to speak. And, um, you know, we're, we're, we're very keen to get to the summit, to actually make it to the top. Maybe we'll succeed and, you know, maybe it will take a century before, before that's possible. Um, but I think, you know, I'm, I'm, really, uh, I'm really very keen on, on the fact that there's, there's an interesting view as we try and climb to the summit. And it's really, really great that, um, that lots of people seem to be interested. And I think it gives us as a, as a species a better chance uh, to be able to actually get to the top, so to speak, and, and sort of answer this, uh, you know, what has been a, a long running question in science of sort of, of, of how the universe fundamentally works. And, and that's, it's, it's, it's really it's very encouraging for me to see that um, there's so much kind of um, general interest by people in the, in the answer to this question. Because it's one that I certainly think is super interesting, but but um, uh, it's it's um, it's great to find out that other people think it's interesting too. Uh, you have been extremely generous with your with your time answering my questions and the questions from uh, everybody following us, uh, and uh, I am very happy that we were able to end uh, with uh, with sharing the screen of what can people do to to help, and of course. Uh, there are many different kinds of help, uh, some that require a couple of PhDs, others that don't. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, the interest uh, that, that you are seeing uh, gives me great hope uh, for uh, the role of, 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 of uh, science and fundamental research, uh, both uh, within the traditional institutional bounds, but uh, through the democratization of science, which was one of the themes uh, of the H plus uh, summit uh, that uh, we held uh, 10 years ago. Uh, it uh, said uh, the rise of the citizen scientist uh, through participation, uh, whether in, in crowds running uh, uh, supercomputer networks in distributed um, uh, ways uh, uh, like, like we are doing today for uh, COVID-19 uh, protein folding uh, uh, or, or, or in other ways. And, uh, and even though, uh, uh, based on your results, uh, that so many of these things are equivalent, uh, we are still uh, very attached uh, to our uh, human ways uh, where we have uh, value uh, judgments uh, around certain outcomes. And my value judgment is absolutely to keep going on a path of reason and science uh, rather than all the other uh, uh, metaphysical or or alchemical or feudal alternatives. Right. So, so I mean, one of the things we're, I'm I'm very interested in, just to to finish here. I mean, the the um, you know we're doing this science project in you know it's both new science and it's a new way of doing science. And you know it's I mean we're just in week you know one and a half of this. Um, and uh, I'm I'm you know the idea that people can contribute. Um, and uh, you know we, we're going to be doing a well this year virtual summer school, and um, you know we're we're seeing lots of people interested in being involved in that, where we're trying to get as many people as possible sort of up to speed with what we've figured out so far. Um, and I think that's um, uh, you know that's sort of an on ramp to people being involved. And uh, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be really interesting to see. I mean, I'm 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 kind of hoping. You know that uh, a bunch of my friends, the sort of the the mainline physicists, there seem to be a bunch of them that are getting interested in what we're doing, and um, I, I think the first results from those folk um, that I'm hoping for is that they will figure out correspondences between things that they've long studied and the kinds of things that we're studying. Um, I think that's the sort of lowest hanging fruit for kind of the uh, uh, the, the people who've been on a particular path in physics for a long time. And um, but I'm I'm seeing um, actually quite uh, quite high degrees of interest. Yeah, Rudy wrote a uh, that's a that's a that's a very very nice. Um, uh, Rudy is is Rudy Rooker is um, uh, he's very good at kind of clarifying and amplifying ideas, and he takes them off all the way into science fiction, so to speak. And yeah, he just sent me this. Uh, I just think I think he just wrote this last night. Um, it's. Uh, it's it's interesting as it as it often is. Yes, that's our summer school, and um, uh, um, 
uh, people um, uh, are encouraged to apply. We're, we'll, um, uh, it's, um, um, we're, we're hoping, you know, some of the people who will be there will be physics PhDs and so on. Um, but uh, we're hoping to have a good on-ramp for people with other kinds of backgrounds um, who uh, are interested in contributing to, to, this, uh, to this effort or are interested in taking what we're learning and spinning it off into all these other areas. All right, well, hey, listen, this is great. We should do this more often than once a decade. Well, uh, I'm sending you a calendar invite for April 23, 2030, and uh, then we can, yes. Uh, yeah, hope, you know, your beard may be whiter by then. <laughs> let's, hope, uh, uh, let's hope we're all um, uh, still alive and well, so to speak. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Yes. Okay. okay. I will. I will uh, greet uh, everybody, uh, saying goodbye to our audience. You're welcome to to, to stay. Uh, and uh, this has been uh, uh, really uh, wonderful. My my camera doesn't like me. I, I'm out of focus for some reason. Sorry, guys. Uh, Stephen has been extremely generous with his time, and uh, and and uh, I am grateful for. Uh, his availability. But as he says, this is uh, an open way of doing so many things. Um, it, he has been uh, live CEO-ing uh, uh, for, for over a hundred sessions uh, doing uh, language design and, and all kinds of uh, decisions around uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the way that he, he runs uh, uh, his company. Um, and and then now uh, he's uh, spending really hours and hours every day, uh, just passionately uh, sharing uh, knowledge and and uh, answering questions, just answering questions from 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 everybody. So um, uh, thank you for uh, Babele uh, and uh, Pietro and uh, uh, Erai uh, and uh, Ross and uh, and Alex. Uh, um, in, we haven't been able to answer all of the questions, but uh, if if you have uh, um, the 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 curiosity uh, and uh, uh, you you can, um, I invite you to to look at the uh, live stream archive in the physics uh, project um, because uh, there's a lot of stuff uh, that is worth uh, uh, looking at uh, and. Uh, uh, I will. I will ask uh, the kind uh, people at uh, Wolfram to maybe include uh, uh, our our uh, session in the uh, in the live stream archive as well as a as a recognition of the fun that we had uh, together. And uh, and uh, so, here I had a question uh, about uh, uh, what was it? Um, yeah, the many worlds uh, interpretation that is. Uh, addressed in one of the live streams. Um, Alex had a question about uh, in, uh, the, the, the simulation hypothesis that is addressed uh, in one of the, uh, the, the live streams as well. Uh, I just received a correction uh, saying that uh, live CEOing is not more than 100, or actually it is, uh, but uh, 341 uh, episodes of live CEOing for over 530 hours of actual live stream. And of course, knowing uh, uh, Stephen, he uh, not only archives, but also is now indexing uh, with machine uh, transcription, topic ext extraction, and he's also designing some beautiful uh, graphical visual uh, representation uh, of the uh, relationships of those topics, uh, I, I guarantee. All right. So um, that was it, two hours together uh, in, in many continents. Thank you very much. Um, I, I don't know if I can even do the usual uh, uh, closing of, uh, of our show, but I will, I will do it. Uh, searching for the question live, uh, please uh, subscribe uh, to the YouTube channel uh, on uh, YouTube slash David Orban. Uh, uh, suggest future guests and vote uh, for the guests uh, that are listed. Uh, join our Discord community uh, and uh, uh, sign up uh, to the to the newsletter. And if you 
like this uh, you can show your appreciation uh, as a as a gesture really uh, by uh, becoming a supporter on uh, patreon thank you very much and uh, see you tomorrow oh my god uh, i don't have the backplate to 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 show you uh, actually uh, i wanted my team to to create it but uh, it looks like they didn't tomorrow we have david brin science fiction author uh, david brin uh, is going to be on searching for the question live uh, for a lot of fun for sure there as well thank you and bye bye